Ben Hewitt was born and raised in northern Vermont, where today he runs a 40-acre livestock, dairy, berry, and vegetable farm. He lives with his wife and two sons in a self-built, off-the-grid house powered by wind and solar energy. Ben is not only a farmer, but a best-selling author. His book, The Town That Food Saved, is the story of a rural Vermont town, town's attempt to create a local food system. Ben believes that regionalized agriculture not only promotes sustainable economic development, it helps create healthy, vital communities. Ben's work has appeared in numerous national periodicals, including the New York Times Magazine, National Geographic Adventure, and Outside. In his blog for the Vermont Commons, Ben wrote, with all the talk of collapse, perhaps what we're witnessing is simply the collapse of a financial system that benefits only the top 1% of the people and an energy system that wreaks havoc. However, he says when he considers the particulars of my small community, of friends and neighbors, and by extension, the particulars of all the small communities of friends and neighbors around me, when he considers them, he cannot help but be optimistic. His most recent book, Making Supper Safe, One Man's Quest to Learn the Truth About Food Safety, is written with humor and a dash of skepticism. And to help him offset his renewable energy footprint, Ben says he drives a really big truck. <laughs> Please welcome Ben Hewitt. Well, howdy. Hey, was that guy Eric unbelievable or what? Can we do one more quick round for Eric? I was absolutely blown away. Um, and I, I, I'm just totally honored to be sharing the stage with uh, someone of, with his capabilities and with Amy Goodman. Um, I got about 20 minutes um, to convince you of something that usually takes me much longer than that to convince people of, uh, which is that your future's in the dirt, okay? Um, and I'd like to start by telling a little story uh, about this book I wrote a couple years ago. <laughs> uh, it's about a town called Hardwick, Vermont. Um, it's about eight miles to the west of my home in Cabot, Vermont, in, northern, in the northern part of the state. Um, and I got interested uh, in the book, you know, first of all, because I have an interest in small-scale agriculture, as, as you've heard, um, but also because uh, in the mid-2000s, I started noticing um, a lot of small-scale ag-based enterprise popping up in this town. And the reason this was so intriguing to me um, was that Hardwick, I guess, how am I gonna put this? Hardwick is a town whose reputation had long preceded it, okay? And uh, by that I mean, you know, this little town of about 3,200 people had sort of come to be known, um, at least in Vermont, as sort of a really sort of tough down and out place. Um, and so I started seeing all of this small scale sort of, you know, sustainable ag uh, popping up and all this talk about sort of blueprinting and implementing um, a healthy food system. And I thought that was just, you know, fascinating. Um, this is downtown Hardwick, by the way. And no, you won't get lost, um, unless you can't tell your right from your left. Um, but I thought this was just fascinating because there was all this conversation about, you know, how local food systems can help revive a, a, a local economy, um, can help bring about some community vitality. And here's a town, well, I would never call it depressed because it was a very, very vibrant community, but economically speaking, was really challenged. Um, for a long time, the unemployment rate in Hardwick has been about 40% higher than the Vermont state average, uh, and the uh, median income about 25% lower. So economically, we're, we're talking about, you know, tough times, um, uh, you know, like so many communities are experiencing right now in this country, um, and by extension across the world. Um, I love this photo because it shows you know, where a lot of Hardwick's reputation actually was sort of cemented, um, which was in the early days of the 1900s when it was a booming granite town. Um, and this is 20 teams of horses pulling that one piece of stone. 
Um, and this area, for a period of about 30 years, 25 or 30 years, was um, the leading uh, granite producing region in the world. So there's Hardwick granite built into um, buildings all across the U.S. Um, then in the 1920s came, uh, guess what, reinforced concrete. And you can imagine what happened to the notion that you were going to ship a block of granite like this across the country. You know, forget about it. And so this is sort of where Hardwick's reputation sort of started to sort of form this idea that it was a tough bare knuckle town for a long time. Um, the last remaining sort of dive bar in town had a sign in the window that said no weapons. Um, and it was not out of irony. Um, so anyway, I started looking into this local food system. You know, I'm like, this is really interesting, but it's not something I would expect here. Um, but that's cool. Maybe this is a, a perfect case study to see if all these things are true, all these things that all these local food advocates are talking about. Um, but I quickly realized I really had no freaking idea what I was looking for. So I came up with what I call the four commandments of local food. Um, and you'll see my disclaimer there. This is according to me. All right? So you may think differently. That's cool. I'm fine with that. Um, you can talk, talk to me about it in the parking lot afterward, all right? Um, okay, rule number one, it shall feed the locals. Does that make sense to anybody, right? <laughs> You're going to have a local food system, let's feed people that are local. Okay, I cool with that, yep. Um, it shall be circular. Okay, the shape of a food system. Let's talk a little bit about the dominant food system in this country, right? Where you have all of these inputs in one end, most of them non-renewable. Agriculture being, as a sector, the largest user of energy in this country, even ahead of transportation. Um, you have all these, all these inputs, you have that sort of mythical 1,500 mile journey of the average calorie in this country, and out the other end, guess what? We throw away 40% of the foods produced in this nation, right? So if anyone tells you that hunger in the United States is an issue of production capacity, tell them to get real. It's an issue of priorities, right? It's an issue of what we really want to do as a people and how we respect those around us who are hungry. Um, Okay, rule number three should be based on sunshine. This is pretty simple, right? It's, it's not going to use a whole bunch of non-renewable inputs to sort of keep it going. It really ties into the whole circularity idea. And rule number four is going to offer viability to producers. Now, there's a contradiction and kind of an issue here with these, I've got to admit. Um, and I'm just going to point it out since I don't have a lot of time. Often I ask for ideas. But um, it's number one and number four. And the problem is, and this is particularly true in a region like Hardwick or in any community that's really sort of uh, economically challenged, um, is that, you know, we have this dominant food system that feeds people for a very perceived low cost of about 9% of their income. It's actually about 9.5 now. Um, and it, if you're trying to operate under sort of an honest accounting of your practices as a producer, you simply can't do that. You cannot put that 9% price tag on your food because you're not externalizing all your costs. And this is a real challenge for people in communities um, who are struggling just to put any food on the table, much less, uh, you know, good, wholesome food that's been produced this, in this manner. Um, this is a question, you know, I get asked a lot, you know, so how, how okay, so you looked at this whole, whole scenario here, spent a whole bunch of time studying, so what, you know, how do you do this? How is this town doing it? How, how does any town do this? Well, child labor definitely plays a huge part, okay? <laughs> And if you want to see a couple of kids dig for potatoes, you just keep them hungry for like two or three days beforehand. <laughs> no complaints. Um, no, that's obviously, those kids are working uh, absolutely of their own free will. That, and um, I am not standing behind them with any kind of whip. Um, diversity is a real key to creating a healthy, vibrant food system. And, and not for just the reason that we think about, which of course is like, you know, if, if you're really trying to feed the locals, you know, the locals are probably going to want to eat more than just one food product, right? So you don't want to specialize in one particular food product. But for less obvious reasons, um, one being the idea uh, that, uh, and the fact that every, every uh, pr product that is coming out of the ground or being raised or being produced is going to rely on different inputs. And if you're trying to utilize inputs from within a region, um, you're going to quickly exceed that region's capacity to produce those inputs if you're specializing in a particular product. There's another really key point to diversity. Um, that I think gets missed a lot, which is um, the fact that when you have a diverse food system with diverse producers, uh, it lends itself to collaboration rather than competition. Um, and if there's one thing that I can say that I find really sort of hopeful and inspiring about what I see going on around me, is that there's an incredible level of collaboration among producers. Um, so diversity, very, very key. Regional fertility, right? Look, we should be taking that 40% of the food that's being wasted and we should be trying to get it to people who could use it. But in the absence of the system to make that happen, we should at least be composting it. I, you know, it's striking to me 
um, how much stuff that we just throw away in this country without any sort of uh, you know, accounting or concept of, of the value that it has. We're throwing away tremendous amount of value in soil fertility every day, everywhere we go in this country. Oh, one too far. Ingenuity, all right? Um, ingenuity is clearly going to have to play a part in all of this. This is a photo of the sellers at Jasper Hill. Um, anyone here heard of Jasper Hill cheese, the sellers at Jasper Hill? All right, yeah, so what they're trying to do here, um, they, they do produce cheese, but they also have developed a facility that can um, handle cheese uh, from dozens, if not hundreds, of small-scale farmstead cheesemakers um, from small dairies in the state of Vermont. Um, and for those of you who aren't, you know, aren't up on what's going on with the dairy industry, uh, it's a small-scale family dairy industry, let me just tell you, right, that's not a business you want to be in. Um, so they're trying to offer an opportunity for other people to come on, maybe start making some cheese, and they can bring it into their aging facility. Everyone knows what this is, I assume, right? You probably have one in your garage, <laughs> right? It's a squash seed extractor. I just like it because it's ingenious and, you know, kind of cool. Um, this is a, a, a photo of Claire's, the restaurant in Hardwick. They, the new restaurant they opened about three years ago. Uh, in the first year of their operations, they did a, a food audit, and they were sourcing 78% of their ingredients from within 15 miles. Right? Yeah. So... If you go, bring your own ketchup, because I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not really hip on the house ketchup. But other than that, man, I'm, I'm all over that place. Um, food Venture Center, I, I need to update this photo, because this place is now up and running. Okay, one of, the, one of the reasons I wanted to do a book on food safety is because as I started looking into the issues of uh, localized food systems and some of the sort of headwinds, um, one that kept popping up is the regulatory environment that almost always favors large-scale production. Right? And it's almost always around the subject of food safety, and it's almost always BS, okay? So here's the Food Venture Center. That said, if you want to produce legally, you're going to have to comply by those regulations. Um, and the problem is, of course, is that it can sometimes cost tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, um, to meet those regulations in your home or, or small business. The idea is that this is a shared-use um, shared commercial facility. Uh, where people can actually rent it by the hour um, or, or longer chunks of time as opposed to having to install this equipment in their home. Um, you know, here's the big question I have. Like, this to me all makes perfect sense, right? That we can create small-scale economies. I mean, look at what's going on in the world right now. Look at what's happening in our communities. You know, this is where the tale of the two hats comes into play, right? I see what's going on in a lot of communities across this country, and I see it as trying to sort of capture something in a hat that looks like this, right? Oh, by the way, I want to point out that this is a hat that uh, led a long and fruitful, wonderful life, and, and no hat was harmed in the making of this presentation. But um, this is what we're doing. We're trying to capture things in this hat. We're trying to capture money, okay? Because the other thing that we got going on here right now is not just an industrial food system, but it's an industrial money system, right? And the industrial money system is blasting through our communities and leaving very little in its wake. Um, so we're trying to capture money, we're trying to capture jobs, we're trying to keep people in our communities, young people in our communities, and we're doing it all with this hat, you know, that's really a piece of junk, frankly. My wife's going to be really upset. Don't let me forget that if I don't, if I don't take that home. So, you know, we need a new hat. There's no, you know, there's no question about it. Um, and I fortunately brought one. Um, all right. Expectations, policy, and big fat lies. This is what's going on right now. Food should be cheap. I can't afford local food. Food should not be cheap! It's the most important thing you put into your body. It's the most important commerce you engage with three, probably more times a day. It should not be cheap. That doesn't mean it's going to make it easy for you to afford it, but it should not be cheap. I don't have time to cook. Okay, listen, there are some real reasons that people don't have time to cook, okay? But not if they're watching 34 hours of TV every week, right? In 2010, we set a record in this country for television watching. 34 hours a week. Okay. The tomato fallacy, you all know the tomato fallacy, I'm sure. You don't. Okay. Um, I got just a minute to explain tomato fallacy, which is based on an experience I had about five years ago when I took my family on what I term the white trash uh, camping vacation, which means we bought an old Dodge van off Craigslist, put a bed in the back of it, and drove to Florida. On the way down to Florida, I see a tractor trailer coming up the other way right, in the, in the northbound lane. It's got these open mesh sides, and it's got green balls, tennis balls. I said, there's a tennis ball factory down here. Look, honey. I said, you idiot, those are tomatoes. The tomato fallacy is the idea that one tomato is equivalent to the other. 
It's the idea that one piece of food is equivalent to the other just because it looks the same, right? It's the idea that we should measure the value of our food by the price tag attached to it. Bogus. Um, times have changed, the inevitability of progress. You hear this all the time. We just can't, we can't go back to this. This is, you know, we, we need to, we're, we're in a new world now. We already talked about the regulation. Zoning, huge issue. We have come to a place in our culture where we want to separate agriculture, the very thing that keeps us alive from our lives, the rest of our lives. Uh, and show me the money. You know, this is so much an issue of money. We need to be talking more and more about how to capture money, how to try to wean ourselves off this industrial money system. Um, I want to talk a little bit about restorative agriculture uh, because, you know, I got nothing wrong, I got no problem with, it, with the idea of sustainable agriculture. It's fine, all right? Sustainable agriculture, whatever, great. It's the current buzzword, it's okay, anyone can use it. Um, but I also don't think it really gets at the actual potential. And I don't think it gets to where we really need to be going. Agriculture's got a lot more potential than to just sustain our communities. It can actually restore them to a place where they're much more healthy and vital. You know, first of all, <laughs> I'm just gonna leave this one up for a while and we can all just sort of stare in awe. Um, you know, we know we have a health crisis in this country. I don't think anyone in this room is probably going to deny that. Um, according to the Harvard School of Public Health, most recently, 1,051,000 diet-related deaths in the U.S. every year. How many people do you think are dying of E. coli and salmonella and all those horrible pathogens that you keep reading about on the headlines of the newspaper that are leading to more regulations annually? Anyone got a guess? 3,000. So I don't want to suggest that those aren't tragic deaths and we shouldn't try to minimize them, but do you read about a million people every year dying from diet-related disease on the front page of the newspaper? No, you don't. Okay, we got to talk about soil here, people. This is absolutely crazy that soil is not a topic of national conversation, right? We're losing topsoil out of the breadbasket of this country 30 times the rate of natural replenishment. 30 times. When was the last time you heard a politician talk about soil? Actually, I think it might have been Roosevelt, it might have been the last one, um, but uh, Will Allen, is he a politician? No. Oh, okay, right. right. I, I think I know who Will is, but I didn't know, he, I, I didn't know if he was a politician or not. But, uh, um, you know, the idea that agriculture, we sort of had it sort of drilled into us recently, I feel like the, that agriculture has to be bad for the environment, but that's only a certain type of agriculture, including livestock production. You know, uh, thoughtful livestock production using uh, uh, techniques such as rotational grazing and mob stocking can actually rebuild soils. And if you want to talk more about that, any of you committed vegetarians or vegans, I've got no problem with vegetarians or veganism, but I'd love to have a conversation about, about thoughtful um, livestock production. Um, local economies, I want to talk really quickly because I think this is one of the, the major key issues where we have a lot of leverage. Uh, we got to get people invited into this conversation and engaged in this conversation who might not otherwise become engaged. They don't care about organic. They don't care about taste. They don't care about health. But you know what they might care about? Money, right? So we know numerous studies show that when we buy anonymous food-like substances from anywhere at the supermarket, about, depending on the study, 15 to 20 percent of every dollar stays in that community. When we go to locally grown direct from producer at a farmer's market, um, or elsewhere, about 50 to 65 percent of that dollar stays in your community. Okay, so here in Massachusetts, how much are you spending per year per, cap or per capita on, on local food? Uh, 638 direct to producer, which is frankly kind of shameful given that Massachusetts is the third richest state in the nation, but whatever, you know, it's no one's, no, it's, it's no one's fault really, but, uh, but your own. Um, so that leads to a total annual revenue of uh, 42 million plus, okay? What does it look like? Um, if you, the the uh, median income per capita income mass thirty three grand, which means the average person spending about three thousand bucks on food. So six dollars out of three thousand is what you're what what we're uh, applying to direct producer sales. Um, what if we went to five percent of our food budget? Whoa! Look at what happens. A billion dollars staying in the state. A billion, right? I know a billion is not what it used to be, but it still looks like a lot to me. Um, what if we went ten percent? Two billion, and remember that 50 to 65 percent of this is staying in your community as opposed to just 15 to 20 percent. What if we got all, I don't know, you know, you can call me a dreamer, but I know I'm not the only one. Um, what if we went to 25 percent? 25 percent, a quarter of your food budget, direct to producer in your communities. Look at that. That's the kind of money we're talking about. This is not a joke, right? 
In Vermont here, I don't know what the numbers are for, for mass, but in Vermont, for every million dollars that's spent uh, by tourists, you're creating 35 jobs. Look at the potential for job creation if we apply that number to agriculture. Okay? Community. This is a huge issue. We've got people in this country moving every 5.2 years on average. Why? Because they don't have work, right? Most often people move because of work. How do you create healthy, vibrant communities of people that give a crap if they're moving every 5.2 years? You don't, right? We need to find a way to keep people, and especially young people in our communities, to reverse the sort of brain drain that's going on all across this nation and keep them there, keep them caring, and keep them engaged. This is what it looks like a little more anecdotally in the region I come from. Um, in about the last five or six years uh, in, the, in the greater Hardwick area, uh, there's been about 100 jobs created um, in the localized ag sector, right? Not, it doesn't sound like a ton, but remember, this is a pretty small community. And this bottom one here um, is amazing. I mean, there are people flocking to this area and staying in this area who all of a sudden realize that there's a future in this area, who thought they were going to have to come down to Boston or to New York City or go to L.A. or to wherever, and now are realizing that they can stay and they can be part of this community where they've grown up. And that, to me, is perhaps the most exciting aspect of all of this. Um, you know, this is not a plug-and-play operation. When I started writing this book and hearing talk about blueprinting this, you know, I sort of took that kind of literally. And, but I quickly realized that every community, of course, has its own strengths and weaknesses. This is not something you can blueprint, but it is something that you can adapt to any community. I truly believe that. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, as I close up here, I've got just, I've got just a minute. Um, this is not a radical notion. What I'm talking about here is not radical. It's not strange. You know, what's been going on for the past hundred years and has only picked up steam that has led to, you know, these, these uh, Wall, Occupy Wall Street movements, that's what's radical and strange. That's what's different. This is what makes sense. And, uh, you know, I'm really just sort of struck by the fact that as a culture, um, we've become so sort of dis, dis, uh, disfranchised and also uh, d detached from the um, sort of the very commerce that is sort of most crucial and most essential to our survival. We've basically subcontracted it out to multinational corporations. That's, that's where we've come to. Uh, and I think we need to sort of get to a place where we can stop asking ourselves, you know, what a, whoa, whoa, where's my last slide there? I'm gonna fly through them. Can I get that uh, full slideshow view up? Oh yeah, my man's coming through for me. There we go. I'm gonna just, because you're gonna miss the best slide if I don't do this. One more. There we go. All right, there we go. Aren't you glad you waited? Um, no, no, listen, I've spoken a little bit about the cost and some of the challenges here, but I wanna, I wanna really emphasize one point before I walk off this stage. So we need to come to a place where we stop asking ourselves, what does it cost to do this? What, is the, what are the challenges to doing this? And start asking ourselves, what is the cost that we're paying right now to maintain the status quo? Thank you very much.